you are faithful, that you love us so much, that you gave your one and only son. Lord, you kept your promise. And to that, Lord, we can say amen. God's good, isn't he? <laughs> Excellent. And that's it for our worship uh, for now. Uh, please give a warm round of applause, whether you're at home or in the room, for, for Joe is going to bring the word this morning. <laughs> about most when I speak. It's not what I've got to say, it's the getting from there to here without falling over. <laughs> and that's, that's just true. So there you go. Um, I'm going to try and not get carried away at actually having people here. I'd just like to remind you all, I don't mind if you laugh when I speak. I've got something really profound to open with this morning. I'm going to share something about myself that none of you know about a collection that I've had at home for, well, since I left home, really. It's a bit of a sad collection. And in the words of some comedians that I rather enjoy, but paraphrase because we're in church, it's not so much that I began to collect this item, more that I could not be bothered to throw it away. <laughs> be honest, is there anybody else in the room who's got a washing basket with a layer of odd socks, which periodically, with a sense of hope and optimism, you try and pair up. Thank you. I see that hand. See, occasionally I'll throw away a sock that I know is definitely dead because of the holes and the threadbareness and the fact that I haven't seen its, its partner for a decade. But generally what happens is at least three times a year I determinedly work to the bottom of the wash basket and wash every stitch of anything we've got in the house. And then I sit down, and this is the only pleasure I ever take in laundry, I try and play pairs with odd socks on my bed. So I lay them all out, and when I find a pair, there's a sense of triumph. But to be honest, I never quite get the satisfaction of pairing everything up. And every time I do this, for the last 40 years, I've thought, when I get them all paired up, I'm going to feel complete and like everything is okay in my life. And any sock that I haven't paired up, what I'm going to do, and I swear I mean it every time I say this, I'm going to throw it in the bin. So I'd like somebody to explain to me why, when I did a count on Thursday, I had 41 odd socks. 41 odd socks. Now that's not even a number of odd socks that you can make into 20 odd pairs. So even if I cheated and got them as close as I could and made 20 odd pairs, I still would not have achieved Sokvana. <laughs> you see, why do I do this? Maybe I'm an optimist who thinks that somewhere in my house there's a secret st sock stash and I'm going to find it, you know, like the lost treasure. How do I end up with so many odd socks? Does the dog eat the odd one? Does it think I'm not being fed enough, I'm going to eat an odd sock? I don't think so, she's not that mean. Does my washing machine occasionally tax me and consume a sock? I don't know. Maybe it does. Maybe that's why we break a lot of washing machines. Or maybe it's just a common human thing to not let go of stuff. Maybe that's it. You see, this pandemic's been a time of hardship. It's been a time of sacrifice. It's been a time of joy and building and family. But it's been a time of rethinking about what's important in our lives. Phrases like a new normal have slipped into common usage. And in some ways, I think that the phrase, a new normal, has explained Christianity ever since Jesus gave himself for us on the cross. Let me explain. Put simply, Jesus changed everything. Yeah. Paul the Apostle writes to the Colossian church, and in chapter 3 of the, the letter to the Colossians, he says, he explains a new normal, the normal that exists because of faith in Jesus Christ. He says, since then you've been raised with Christ, Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. 
Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. These are amazing verses. They talk about the transformation which has taken place. We are now raised with Christ. Our old self, our sinful nature, our past has died with Christ and our new self is raised with him. Problem solved. Everything's okay now. The old's gone, the new's come. It's all easy. We can live good, pure, holy lives. But you see, Paul says that we must set our minds on things above. Now this is one of the great mysteries of faith. Our salvation is absolutely complete through Jesus. We're seated with him in heaven already. Yet simultaneously, we're also still here on earth with all the pressures, distractions and temptations that we've always been subject to. So we're made made right with God through Jesus, but we still have to choose to live in a way which reflects our new normal. We have to set our minds on things above, not earthly things. So, how do we as believers do that? I believe it's a two-step process. A process that we need to take all the time, every day, and sometimes multiple times a day. Step one, we have to put down the bad stuff. Step two, we need to pick up the good stuff. Sorry, this is really simple stuff this morning, but it's what got laid on my heart. You see, this is a choice thing. In Christ, we're made new, but every day we have to choose whether we're going to live that new, that new normal, or whether we're going to slip back and live a different way. Have you ever walked on a beautiful, empty beach? This is another of my great flaws, of which Neil probably needs medals for putting up with. If you're walking on an empty beach and you see a shell, a really good one, you know, a beautiful one, or a pebble that's shiny and lovely, you kind of got to pick it up, haven't you? Now, imagine that you're doing that, but you've got no pocket scissors. So there's just you and these two things. So eventually, you're going to pick up so many good shells that to pick up the next one that's even better, you've got to put some stuff down. Do you know, in my whole experience of God, which has been a lot of years now, when God wants us to put something down, it's always because he has something better for us to pick up. In verses 5 to 9, we read of the things that Paul tells us to put down, to get rid of, to do away with. He says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also get rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. That's a harder list, isn't it? Do not lie to each other, since you've taken off your old self with its practices. Why does Paul want us to get rid of these things? Paul wants us to get rid of these things, because they're the things that hurt us and hurt others. If God wants you to put something down, it's because he's got better for you. You see, those things are parts of the old self, the sinful nature which clings to us despite of our new selves. But they don't reflect the nature of God. And remember, Paul's already said that our lives are now hidden with Christ in God. Our new normal should reflect the nature that we now carry. Now, I'm not going to focus on the bad stuff because it always seems slightly ironic to me when we get old school and attack the sins we see in the world. Because you see, the truth is that we've got no more power to resist sin than anyone else. What we do have is a saviour who's paid the price for our sin and will help us to overcome sin as we walk with him. It's his strength, not ours. So there's no good pointing a finger at somebody else who's getting it wrong because without Jesus, you're getting it wrong too. You see, personally, I think it's much more helpful to dwell on and focus on the positive things, the things that we're told to take up, the good characteristics we're told to have, which reflect the nature and character of God. Now, you see, an athlete who wants to improve the performance doesn't watch endless playbacks of their failures and weaknesses. If you want to get better at catching, 
in cricket, you don't watch that horrific drop that lost the match for you again and again and again. What you do is you watch good catches. You watch good practice. You study playbacks of your success. And you build on the good things. You look for small improvements in your technique. You see, we're people. We do this thing at about 3 o'clock in the morning for me. It might be 2 or 4 for you, I don't know. But we endlessly replay our memories of weakness and failure. We begin to believe that we can never change. Because we're looking at the failure, not the potential. You see, it's time to let our past be in the past. God has wonderful things for us, his children. So moving on to the new normal in Christ, verses 10 to 17, tell us, put on the new self, which, been, which has been renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there's no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. But Christ is in all and is in all. Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has any grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. That's what we pick up. That's who we become when our lives are hidden in Christ. In place of anger, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips, we're told to clothe ourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Do you know the people you connect with in the world, when they look at you, they won't see an absence of bad stuff. They'll only see the good stuff. It's how we're wired. We hardly ever recognise that somebody doesn't speak badly, but we certainly know when they do speak well of us. We're wired that way. We're wired to be attracted to the positive. You see, when we put down one way of living, we need to take up another. When we put down our own nature, we need to put on new behaviour, which reflects the character of God. We're encouraged to build each other up, not knock each other down. The word tells us to let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with wisdom through psalms, hymns, songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. There's some advice about how we do that in there. We teach and admonish each other with wisdom through psalms and hymns. That means we read the word. We sing along in church. We take part in the corporate worship of church. And that builds us up and helps us to build others up. You see, words are powerful things. If we return to my sad sock collection... I'm still hanging on to them like I still hang on to some of the baggage that I carry because I'm human. We all carry stuff we ought to put down. Words spoken to us when we were even small children can carry ridiculous significance in our lives. Ooh, you're not as clever as your brother, are you? That was in primary school. And no, I wasn't as clever as him then, but... (laughs) Ooh, you're a disappointment, aren't you? If only you were better at it. My particular, my particular thing from childhood, which I'm dealing with, it's going in the bin, I promise you. You can't do that. You're not a boy. Oh, you're only a girl. You're only, you can't play football. You can be the goalpost because you're only a girl. I actually sat there as a goalpost in a field. How stupid was I? I grew up in the 70s. It was like that in the 70s. It's not like that now. When my daughter's list of stuff she needed for university was a bag full of really good tools. 
and some steel toe cap boots. Nobody batted an eyelid. Yes, we are changing for the better. If you were always picked last, not necessarily, this is, if you were picked last because you were bad at sports, that's poor. But if you were picked last and were fairly good at sports, but you just weren't in with the in crowd, that's not good. That internal voice that reminds you that last time you tried to do something, you failed. Do you know, these are all the things we can choose to put behind us, because in our new normal, God says, God says that you're called. He says that you're chosen. He says that you're loved. He says that you're a child of God. He says that you're a co-heir with Christ, regardless of whether you're a boy or a girl. Bit of a bugbear. You're forgiven. You're a new creation. And you're righteous because of Jesus. Do you know what I did yesterday? I threw my single sock collection away. I put it all in a bag and I put it in the bin. And if next week, one or two of the missing ones turn up, who cares? Primark's open again, I'll buy more socks. You see, that layer of socks at the bottom of my ironing basket, or more accurately, what would be my ironing basket if I ever ironed anything, I've got to say that one of the biggest things I gave up when I stopped working in an office was ironing shirts. I just buy the ones that don't need ironing now. That layer of socks is gone forever. It's in the bin. And I can move on from them. I'm not constantly trying to complete them. Now, this is a silly, trivial example. But as good, solid evangelicals, we sometimes underestimate the power of symbolism. If there's something which drags you down in your life, imagine it's an old sock and get it in the bin. If we weren't restricted in terms of movement, I would have brought a basket of my socks, washed, washed, (laughs) and a bin. And I'd invited you to come and take the sock and think it's that thing that somebody said you can't do. You can't do that because, you can't do that before. Because this is now my sock and I'm going to metaphorically put that I can't do in the bin. And I'm going to pick up the I can do's in God. We can't do that because of the way things are. But we're going to have a moment where we bring to God our odd socks. And we ask him to replace them with his promises for our lives. So we're just going to take a moment now. And we're just going to think that thing that somebody said you can't do and stops you from doing it even today. Or that thing you want to stop doing but can't stop doing. Just imagine it's that sock. And you've got it in your hand. And you've got the power to hold it and track it with you for the next 30 odd years like I've done with some of them socks. Or you can take it and you can dump it in that bin and pick up what God says about you. That you are dearly loved and chosen in him. And that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. So we're going to do an odd thing. And I encourage you to do this at home. We're just going to take a minute. Just a minute because it shouldn't take you long. Because these things, you know that they're there. You don't have to dredge them up. And we're just going to pray. And we're going to like metaphorically dump those socks in a bin. Lord, we want to thank you that you know all the things that we carry with us that we've carried too long. You know the negative words that have been spoken over us that we carry with us. You know our fears. You know the things that trip us up. You know the things that constantly we fail on. But Lord, you love us anyway. And you've covered it all. So Lord, we ask that by your love and grace and mercy, you'll help us to take those odd socks of belief and behaviour and dump them in the bin and move on with you and pick up what you say about us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we have the band back, please? Oh, there's another page of this, but I know what it says, so don't worry about it. It's It's got lost in the shuffling. You see, there's a prayer that we pray... This, this might not have made sense to you because you've never taken that step and actually said to Jesus, Jesus, come and be part of my life. Because I said that this was a two-step process of putting stuff down that we shouldn't be carrying 
and picking stuff up that we should. But you can only make that two-step base, uh, that two-step process, after you've taken the most important step of all of coming to faith in Jesus Christ. So if you've not given your life to Jesus, if you've not invited him in, so you don't recognise that daily struggle with the old and new, there's a prayer that we pray. I invite you to pray it and then get in touch with us. There'll be numbers on the screen that you can get in contact. Let us encourage you and celebrate with you. But even if you've prayed this prayer before, it doesn't hurt to pray it again because we all need constantly to come to the source of our strength, Jesus, to the source of all love and grace in our lives, our Father God, and to the Holy Spirit who enables us to actually walk at all. The prayer goes like this. Lord Jesus, I know I've done things wrong in my thoughts, words and actions. There are so many good things I've not done. There are so many wrong things I have done. I'm sorry for those wrong things and turn from everything I know to be bad. You gave your life for me on a cross and gratefully I give my life back to you. Now I ask you to come into my life. Come in as my saviour to clean me. Come in as my Lord to lead me. And I will serve you all the remaining days of my life. Amen.